everybody this is Jarrell mason aka j mason welcome to another episode of beyond the album cover where we get inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated with me right now i have a fellow music lover like myself lover of various genres topics of all themes music and we're going to get into it today with mr donald peoples donald thank you for coming on to beyond the album cover sir Hello, Jarrell. Um, thank, thank you for inviting me onto your show. It's a pleasure. Yes, sir. And I want to say, here. yes, sir. And I want to say shout out to my boy, Rashawn, a.k.a. the professor of the professor's lounge. Hope he's listening, watching. So what up, Rashawn? We got to get you back on the podcast again soon, bro. All right. So let's go ahead and let's jump right into it. So where were you born and how did you first fall in love with music? Was it where family played your music and you fell in love or you saved up your allowance to go to whatever store to buy records? Um, hello, everyone. I was born in Jamaica, um, Queens, um, South Jamaica, Queens. Um, I've been a lifelong resident in um, South Side Jamaica, Queens, um, except for one year. Um, but I'm a, um, I would, would people consider a town. So um, I'm a townie. Um, I fell in love with music. I love music all of my life, ever since I was a little boy. Um, my grandparents, I was raised by my father's um, parents, Eugene and Sally Peoples. Um, my father, um, Abdul um, Peoples, and my, my uncle, Ronald Peoples, and um, my aunt, Gail Slaughter, we lived in, in the same house. And um, music was always played. My grandparents were, were young grandparents. Um, they, when I was born, they were in their 40s. So of course they were still living their lives. When we look at our grandparents, we don't we don't consider um, their youth. So there was music always in the house. Um, they had many vinyl records, as did my aunt. Oh, I almost forgot. How could I forget my aunt Regina? Um, we called her Tootsie Roll. Um, it was just music all in the house. Um, Ro Regina um, had had her own musical stash. And my uncle Ronald was a huge Jackson's fan, Michael Jackson. He was a music fan all together. My my father, everybody in the house were, you know. So I grew up with music. I grew up watching various music, music programs, Soul Train, American Bandstand, Sha Na Na, if y'all y'all remember Sha Na Na was. Um that was like a that, that was like a doo um variety show with um, John Bowser. Um, there was also Midnight, I think Midnight Special, that came on Friday nights, late at night. Um, they were, we watched musical, spe um, we watched all the awards, the American Music Awards. Um, we watched the NWACP Image Awards. We watched musical stuff. Michael Jackson was so huge in our home. My grandparents subscribed to Ebony and Jet, those legendary magazines in, Black households. So I was very aware of musicians. Um, I love my music videos. I watch Friday night videos, um, New York's hot tracks, um, <laughs> Rap City, um, Video Music Box, of course, um, and the Jukebox Network, the box. So I, oh, and Yo MTV Raps. So I was always surrounded by music. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned uh, Video Music Box hosted by Uncle Ralph, Ralph McDaniels, and Lionel mm -hmm. the Big Kid Martin, who had the pleasure of interviewing and how in that documentary, Ralph McDaniels had stated he had mm -hmm. tried to pitch Video Music Box to MTV, but they ended up turning it down, and then a year or so later, they ended up creating Yo! MTV Raps, which, looking back in hindsight, it was a blessing in disguise because I felt had Video mm -hmm. Music Box would have went national, it would have yeah. lost that New yeah. York aesthetic. And thanks yes. to the internet, internet, those of us outside of the tri-state area could be able to see what made Video Music Box so special amongst kids and teens that grew up in the tri-state area in the 80s, 90s, and still going on to this day of yeah. how he is the curator of hip hop to see him still have all that archival footage on tape of legends past that's no longer there and just moments in hip hop that you're like, man, he was there. And Ralph McDaniels is the hip hop ambassador at Queens Library in Jamaica, Queens. 
um he has his he has his live um programs every Saturday, I believe around twelve or one. I see him all the time. Um, I um when I when I go to Queens Library after work to to pick up my holds and all of that stuff, I see him all the time. I see him moderating programs at Queens Library at the Central Branch. So I I I see him all the time, and just to see someone who I grew up watching, um, after school here in Jamaica Queens during the eighties. And the '90s, okay. I remember turning to Channel Thirty One, watching um, Video Music Box with Ralph McDaniel, just very down earth brother. And I remember when some episodes would come on Friday nights um, at eleven o'clock or at twelve o'clock, and um, that's legendary. And just to know that Video Music Box is so, still revered, like he archived all of this rap hip hop history. You know, he is a he is a God sent, a spirit sent. And um, you know, and I'm glad that it didn't go national because like you said, it would have diluted the message. Because we as you know, rap began as grassroots until um corporations decided that they can make money off of it, like every musical art form that we started as black people. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, so yeah, I was going to say now with you being from Queens or rap being birthed in the Bronx, was a lot of those early rap records coming to your borough late because it seemed like it was being transported from Bronx out from copies of party tapes and people hearing from word of mouth, yo, you hear about this party in the Bronx or Staten Island, Queens, Uptown, and it made its way around like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you my earliest memory of um, listening to rap. Um, there used to be jams in the park. I lived I lived across the street from the Van Wick um playground. It's now the Norelli Har Hargreaves playground. Nobody even cares about Norelli Hargreaves, but everybody knew it was the park. Um the basketball court, um, the baseball court, and then the playground for the kids. So the jams would come during the summer. I remember I'm gonna say 1985. Um, matter of fact, my uncle um Eddie James Coleman. Um, who was known as Spank? He was part of a of uh, one of the earliest Queens um rap hip hop groups called Cypher Sounds, um that was started by Tony Moore out here in Queens. And my uncle Eddie was known as Spank Spank, um, and I I have heard about of course Run DMC, LL Cool J, um, and I'm trying to rem and oh and um. Freaking Frack. Yes, Freaking Frack um, was one of the earliest um, um, Black female um, hip hop lyricists. Um, they were in, they came from the neighborhood. Um, Adrian and Nadine. That was their, they were names, Adrian and Nadine. And everyone knew about Freaking Frack. And we all, I also know about Salt and Pepper. Um, yeah, because they used to work at, um, Sears in Green Acres Mall. And um I believe I believe Salt's aunt worked in a bar on Remington's Street and Liberty Avenue called Austin's. Yes, Austin's was very notorious in my neighborhood. Everyone went to Austin's and I believe Salt's aunt worked at Austin's. And um we all knew about um the the father um wait a minute. We knew about her um her baby daddy. Um Taco. Yeah, we we <laughs> Yeah, so we knew we knew about this. I would say 1985 was my earliest memory of um knowing about people from Queens. Um I I didn't I because I I'm trying to think, because when I was six and when I was six or seven years old, I didn't really know too much about it. I mean, of course, we looked at um we heard um the Sugar the Sugar Hill Gang were, were, were on television shows and it was a time when rap was considered um that culture. So but as far as the Bronx history, I started learning about that history in the nineties. So I didn't really know too much about about rap originating in the Bronx until the nineteen nineties. Right. Yeah, because when you look at Run DMC and what they did with Raising Hell and how 
they really brought rap to the national forefront and international, of course, once walked this way with Aerosmith became an MTV mm -hmm. staple and was a part of one of the first rap tours to really go national, the Fresh Fest, which was put together by Michael Malden, who's is the dad of Jermaine Dupree, who was a dancer wow. on the Fresh Fest, and it was sponsored by Swatch, Swatch Watch, and the Fat Boys, rest in peace, uh, Prince Marky D, Human Beatbox, Buffy, mm -hmm. about how during that time around 85, 86, 87, that was when rap really started to break from being mm -hmm. a regional sound to being mm -hmm. national because I was just listening to a recent interview done with DJ Cash Money out of Philadelphia by DJ Shortcut out of the Bay Area and Rhythmatic out of LA. And they were talking about how because there was no internet back then and everything was going through word of mouth, you necessarily didn't know what was going on on the other side of the country and how everything was coming over to certain sections late. Mm -hmm. I can attest with being from North Carolina and in the South, we got stuff late, but we had the added benefit of a lot of people from up North going to school down South and they would transport mm -hmm. a lot of those WBLS 98.7 kids takes those WHBI tapes down South with them. So that's how we got those hip hop records and our exposure to that was through people coming back south from the north. It was kind of like the inverse of the Great Migration, so to speak, when a lot of those yeah. northern kids would go to those HBCUs down south. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to mention how um, uh, my Uncle Eddie, Eddie knew Russell Simmons. Eddie was going to be, Eddie was signed to Def Jam Records, but some, some personal stuff happened in my uncle's life that he didn't really get to that level. Um, yeah, because he he was he was close friends with Russell Simmons. Um he knew he he knew um he knew he knew Run. He he knew um um DMC. He knew Jam 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 Master J personally. Um he knew um matter of fact he knew Angela and Vanessa's mother. You know, so he was you know he I remember him having a poster of the Run DMC movie, tougher, tougher than leather. Yeah, I remember him having that poster of that because he was he was of the Def Jam family, but of course, personal things befell him. Mm -hmm. Um, there was distraction. Um, you know, you know when you are destined to be something and to go places, mm -hmm. and you still have those personal or family demons. Right. So I would say, I would say that. Um, I remember um, going to Russell Simmons' office to get an envelope for him um, because he had, he had he had served some prison time, and I'm very transparent about different things. So I'm just like very open. Um, well, I couldn't even go into the office. One of Russell's secretaries had to give me the envelope. It was money, you know. So Eddie already knew Eddie and Russell already arranged everything. So I came, but just to know that, you know. And just to know that um, Eddie was a part of um, the early Queens hip hop history, that's amazing. You know, I didn't find out on, on this until his death in 2009. Yeah. I wish I, I would have known how he contributed to early Queens hip hop history. You know, yeah. Yeah, now did they end up cutting records on a local label or did they get distribution by a national label, if you know of? Um, I believe it was local. I don't think it was on a national level yet. Um, because at that time, 1985, 1986, rap was seen as as negative. Um, corporations were not trying to distribute rap as much as that um at that time um we 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 know the histories of um Sylvia Robinson Sugar Hill Records we know about that and I didn't know that until um when I got um older the the artist oh, was an artist who had pillow talk like it was just a lot of it was mostly local um stuff it, it wasn't I don't I don't think it was on the national until I could be wrong I don't think it was on the national level until the nineties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to back up to Sylvia Robinson for a minute and how Sugar Hill Records out of Jersey and a woman at that running yeah. that label 
really yeah. had the foresight to say, let me take this Burgo and genre that's popular in the streets and put it on record. And Master G, his little brother was Lee O'Brien, who played Richie in Last Dragon. Yeah, th yeah, that was Master G, Master G's brother. And how, you know, when you first heard Rapper's Delight, they didn't even think about making a radio edit. It was, I believe, 14 minutes straight of them just rapping. But I believe mm -hmm. it wasn't until once Russell, Greg, and Larry Smith, who we don't talk about enough for his contributions to hip hop with the stuff that he did with uh, Houdini, Curtis Blow, mm -hmm. Fat Boys. It was where rap really started to develop its identity of, okay, we got to make a record that's for the radio. But like you were stating at that time, rap was looked at as the bastard stepchild of R&B and how you didn't mm -hmm. really have a merging of the two genres until no. a young child prodigy producer from St. Nicholas Projects made that happen. We're going to fast forward to that one later. But how BLS, KISS, and a lot of radio stations, mm -hmm. they would day part rap records where you mm -hmm. can only hear rap on weekends or mm -hmm. after 9, 10, 11 o'clock yes. at night. So that way it yes. wouldn't affect the ratings. But when you got those tapes of Mr. Magic's Rap Attack or Chuck Chill Out, DJ Red Alert, mm -hmm. or any underground college mm -hmm. radio rap show, yes. they were currency in schools on Delancey Street yes. or anywhere where you could get your hands on hip hop because it was the only source where you could hear it. Before you had the birth of your all hip hop, all rap stations like 1580 K Day mm -hmm. out west in LA. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought all of this up because I'm thinking about Wendy Williams. Um, Wendy Williams, um, as we know, she she was on Kiss FM here in New York, um, Hot 97. But when she was on Kiss FM, I remember her playing Push It. I saw and Pepper every night around 9.30. Salt and Pepper were like my older sisters I never had. Um, I my Oh my goodness, I loved Salt and Pepper. Salt and Pepper's music carried me through my childhood into my adolescence. And just to, I used to love, I used to, I used to have to be in the bed because um, I had to go to school, you know, during the week the next day. And I'm, I, I will get up dancing to um, the bullshit. But Wendy played Push It every night at 9.30. And um, Saw and Peppers is legendary out here in Queens because that's where they came from. The fact that um, um, Saw and Pepper met at a job working in Sears in Green Acres Mall, Valley Stream, and decided to take the journey further. You know, and it's like, wow, but I just wanted to come back to Wendy. Yeah, so Wendy Williams, um, um, like you said, was playing rap after nine o'clock, 10, 10 o'clock at night, because like you said, rap was not received as a positive um, um, art form. Mm. Yeah, and then it wasn't until you had the likes of, you know, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince Hammer, Vanilla Ice, everything mm -hmm. started to make rap a little bit more palatable to corporations and to radio station MDs and PDs because it wasn't the scary stuff that you were hearing on Underground and back to Salt and Pepper. They, to me, on the female side for hip hop, they did what Run DMC did for rap, what they did mm -hmm. you know, for women. And hip hop because when you think about them, they were the ones that kicked the door down. So while there were other groups that came before them, like Sequence with um, yes. "We're Gonna Funk You Right On," which was yes. featured Angie Stone. Yes, yes. Angie Stone before she became in yes. Vertical Hole and her solo yes. tip. She was in Sequence from uh, Columbia, South Carolina, by the way. Um, you also had uh, Finesse and Sequence, who was signed to yeah. Uptown Records, who I really don't really underrated. We're going to talk about them once we talk about Uptown Records and New Jack Swing. But really, Salt and Pepper, they got their foot in the door by doing an answer record. 
because that was kind of the way you kind of got in in those days, you know, with uh, Roxanne Shantae with her dissing UTFO, with Roxanne, mm -hmm. Roxanne with Roxanne's Revenge. Then, of course, the real Roxanne, Roxanne's Got a Man, um, Sparky D and Pebbly Poo. And mm -hmm. then with the Showstopper that Song Pepper put out, that was their response to Dougie Fresh Slick Rick, the show. And when that came out and got some local buzz, that was when they put out, I think it was Hot, Cool, and Vicious was their first record, I believe. And there was another DJ that was in Song Pepper before Spinderella came in. And then there was an original version of Push It on the album that wasn't the version we all know and love today. That version was done by the late DJ out of Camiel in San Francisco, Cameron Paul who I had a chance to interview was giving me the backstory behind how he came up with that record. Where he heard the original, was like, mm, let me go ahead and add my spin to it. And he added his flavor to it, and that's the version of Push It that we all know and love today, and how we don't talk about Herbie Lovebug Azar enough either. He's one of the unsung heroes of hip-hop, and it's very rare that you get to hear him speak and talk, because he rarely does interviews, but about how, you know, Salt and Pepper, him, get in play. Him, Kwame was under his camp with Idol Makers. I think Sweet Tea was under him as well. And about how when Salt and Pepper became big, that kind of set up Hit and Play because if you notice, they were in the Shake Your Thing video and it was kind of yes. thing where it's like, okay, yes. one is going to set the other up for them to come out and it's almost where we're going to build on each other. Almost kind of sort of like how, you know, when Prince decided, let me go ahead and put some acts together to get all this extra creative stuff out of me. So I'm going to put the time. I'm going to have Vanity Six, Apollonia yes. Six. I'm yes. going to have the family. Yep. And it's all going to be associated with me, even though they're all different acts. So it's almost of that same thing where you're going to have one set the other up. And I thought that that was real genius that Herbie Lovebug did that with Song Pepper, Kid and Play, Kwame yes. and Sweet Tea. See, I, I I didn't I didn't know that part about Kwame. I I until now. So yeah. um, thank you thank you for teaching me. Yeah. I had no clue about that because, like you said, I've owned I've only when it came, when it comes to Herbie, I've always known Salt and Pepper and Kid and Play. I never knew about Kwame. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kwame was affiliated with the um the Idol Makers camp, and you know, just thinking about hip hop and you know what Rick and Ruben did with Def Jam, Run DMC, and of course, won't be no Def Jam if it wasn't for LL, who was the first artist mm -hmm. signed to Def Jam, but the first mm -hmm. actual release on Def Jam, co with Party Time, was Tila Rock. It's yours, and then from Tila Rock, it's yours. That was when LL ended up getting signed to Def Jam, putting out Radio in 85 and the mm -hmm. rest of history. And then, of course, when Rick saw Beastie Boys and said, nah, you're going to ditch this punk look. You're going to go more hip hop. And then when License to Ill dropped at 86, that really, along with Run DMC, like I mentioned earlier, expanded rap to middle America. Yeah, I re I remember all of that. I I because I I was wondering as a little kid, who are these who are these white guys rapping? You know, I you know because I was when they came out, I was eight. You know, and just to just to see, you know, just to get the um, comprehensive history as an adult, it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, wasn't DJ isn't DJ Hurricane um, Beastie Boys DJ from Queens? Isn't he from Queens? Do you know of? I think he, I think he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, DJ Hurricane, and you know, just based on Queens alone, we could make a list of all the rappers that came out of there. But also spawned off of Def Jam was a young man. He was a rapper, uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. They had Genius mm -hmm. Rap, which sampled Genius of Love by the Tom Tom Club, and then he later went into the management side, working at rush management and then it was around 1986 ended up leaving rush management management to form his own record label called uptown records 
And I'm talking mm. about the late great Andre Harrell and how mm. because of Uptown, we have the merging of New Jack Swing, although the template of that I feel was full force, because full force was yes. merging that, you know, yes. prior to you know what Teddy came out with in 87 with Key Sweat and Make It Last Forever, but Full Force was doing that as well with their own work, UTFO, Lisa Lee's in the Cold Jam, Cheryl Pepsi Riley. Nice. But once Uptown Records debuted, and then of course you had Make It Last Forever in 87 with Key Sweat. Then the year later, Guy's debut album. Mm -hmm. Then Bobby's Don't Be Cruel album, which mm -hmm. my prerogative was yes. Teddy produced yes. records. But majority of the album was produced by L.A. Reid and Babyface. But it was a Teddy Riley record that really set that off. So can you talk about, from your viewpoint, when you first heard of the new Jack Swing sound and how Teddy took the emerging sounds and styles of hip-hop, meshed it with the melodic tones and the chord structures and sensibilities of R&B and gave R&B a fresh, youthful attitude and aggressive sound? I'm gonna tell you, Jarrell. Um, I I remember those times vividly. I was around 12, um, in junior high school, and just watching the music videos. I mean, it, Teddy's Teddy's innovation of like I said merging um merging rap with R and B was a great. That was a great move. That was a great thing because, like you said. Um, rap, rap had to get out of that negative space of whatever stereotypes that came along with rap. Um, because you you had a lot of the old generation. Oh, I, that's a bunch of mess. That's the thing. You know, every gen, every generation is there's always a backlash against a new new art art forms. So what Teddy did, um, Teddy, I would say Teddy. Um, how can I say? Um. I want to say Teddy took rap out of elementary school and brought it into um, junior. Oh, no, I mean, I'm gonna say he took it out of uh, yeah. I, I, I can say maybe out of elementary or junior, um, junior high, taking it to to um to high school, mm -hmm. um. And just all of those great artists, um, up Uptown Records, um, um, Keith Sweat, Rex and FX, um, Heavy Heavy D, Heavy D and the Boys, um, why am I forgetting? Oh, then you got Guy and Mary J. Blige came along. I'll be sure. Um, I'll be sure. Yes, I'll be sure. Um, Chris Bobby Brown, all these. Mm hmm. Christopher Williams. Yes, Christopher Williams. How can I forget that? Christopher Williams. These were, I mean, these were top chop chart topping people. Um the it, it was fun because you could go to the club, listen to this music, no backlash. People were have people were having fun going to the clubs, um, relieving their minds away from the stresses of life, whatever they were. And we were just going through that volatile political climate of Reagan going to the bush. And Bush going slowly into Clinton, you know. So um, people just needed uh, that that those outlets to go and dance and just listen to this great innovative music. And um, that the um, the New Jack Swing um, and then New Jill Swing because of Merit. Oh, that changed a lot of things. That changed a lot of things. And those 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 genres those sub genres ushered into the nineties. But I would say that the the New Jack Swing it was pumping, it was pumping. I loved, I loved all of those um those musicians, those those artists, the songs. It was just, it was a transformative time, which was needed, which was very needed. Yeah, because going back and listening to records prior to eighty five R and B wise, it was very mellow, very soft, very yeah. adult. Because you were still in that boogie era, like with Howard Johnson, D Train, everything that was on Prelude. Yes. And then yes. you had later on the 
hush period with Paul Lawrence, Lilo Thomas, Freddie Jackson, Melba Moore, Kashif, Melissa Morgan, uh, Evelyn Champagne King. And then when Full Force came, you kind of had a little sprinkle of that in. Then when Jam and Lewis got with Janet to work on control, you kind of heard mm. a little bit of the template of New Jazz Swing there with the aggressive sound, the hard beats, especially nasty. But then once Make It Last Forever came out by Key Sweat in 87, and then of course, I'll Be Sure in Effect Mode in uh, 88, those two albums really set off New Jack Swing and really gave R&B some bass in his voice because like I said, it was very adult oriented and it was one of the first times prior to you know, Motown of the 60s, that it was going to be R&B for youth. The only difference was that New Jack Swing was being made by youth for you. Right. Whereas Motown, right. it was adults writing songs that were for, like, young adults. Right. And um, I wanted to, and I wanted to say how um, the New Jack Swing era um, introduced um, Albie Shore and Bobby Brown as Teen idols for girls, as I remember, they had they had their nine one they one nine hundred hotlines. Mm -hmm. So um, we were seeing we were seeing these artists in publications such as Work Um Right On Word Up Yo, and the fact that you 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 had girls um going 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 Gaga for Albie Shaw and for Bobby Brown. You know, I, I think that's not really spoken about a lot of how how, how that era of music um, gave rise to the teen idols and sex symbols in the hip hop world. Um, I mean, some people can argue that, um, and of course we saw LL. LL became the same thing too, especially the late 80s, but I would say the early 90s, um, when he came out with his um um Mama's gonna gonna knock you out album. Mm -hmm. I think that that was the game changer for LL to become that heart drop in the um industry. So that New Jack and of course Christopher Williams, you know, the, the these men were becoming these sex symbols. And um so that 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 was a game changer too. Like, okay, the introduction the um transition from from hip hop as a grassroots to um to um to these collaborations but most importantly the the marriage between hip hop and rap which was so important and um and I think that also led to um Quincy Jones's back on the block because I this I think some people think back on the block was the marriage between rap and hip hop, hip -hop at the same time no it really wasn't um Quincy Jones that on the corporate level, he jumped on the bandwagon with that. Right. Which was very smart of Quincy because a lot of the music industry heads that had some skin in the game was really still looking down on rapping. Quincy put his hand out and say, hey, Kumo D, hey, Ice-T, hey, Big Daddy mm -hmm. Kane, come join me because he was able to see this is for the young and it's not for us to judge because it's not for us and that this is going to be something new, something that's going to be here to stay. And I believe that album, of course, they won us for Quincy. I believe it won a Grammy. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it really established him as saying, hey, I'm going to embrace the youth, not shun them be old man yelling at clout. But I want to back up real quick. And you mentioned Bobby Brown and about how his 900 number and his success really catapulted New Jack Swing into the mainstream because a lot of people tend to think that Don't Be Cruel was a solo debut. It wasn't. He put out King of Stage in 86. It was a moderate successful album. But the last record on that album, the title cut, you can hear the direction he wanted to go in because he wanted to have that bad boy, that hip hop persona. He had Mixed Master Ice from UTFO cutting on that record. But MCA was still seeing him as 
you know, this is Bobby Brown from New Edition. So we're going to have mm-hmm. music that still sounds very New Edition-esque, like Girlfriend right. and Girl Next Door. Those are great records spending right. time. Those are great records, but it really didn't tap in to truly who Bobby was as an right. artist. But he found that sweet spot once he ended up hooking up with L.A. and Babyface, where they yeah. were able to merge, as I like to like to call it, the street with the sweet. Mm, the street with the with the sweet. Yeah, I know you're liking these analogies because if you think about it, some radio stations wouldn't even play the regular version of "Don't Be Cruel" that had the rap in it because once again, radio stations were still hesitant to play rap. So this was back when you had singles out that clearly stated "Radio Edit" without rap. Right. Right. Um, and I also wanted to go back a little bit as far as Bobby Brown, because I remember seeing the the one nine hundred hotline on TV um, with my grandmother, um, and I told I told my grandmother, "That's Bobby Brown from New Edition." She was surprised because we, you know, we knew about New Edition. Um, Rogina had Rogina had their first um, album actually. Rogina used to go to the Wiz. That um nobody beats the Wiz. It became nobody beats the Wiz, but it was it was simply the Wiz. We had the Wiz right in on Jamaica Avenue, right on um uh the corner of um, Jamaica Avenue and what was then called New New York Boulevard. It became Guy, Guy Rural Boulevard in around 1986. But the Wiz was right there on the corner, and um my aunt used to go to the fabric store to buy her fabric. She used to she used to love to um the knit and the sew. So the Wiz was right on that corner of Jamaica Avenue and um, New York New York Boulevard. Um, the 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 J train that was that was the that was like one of the last stops on the J train. The J train coming from Brooklyn going into Queens. That I think that was like the the second to last stop here in Jamaica Queens. But the Wiz was the corner, so um, my aunt would buy her vinyl. So when we um, and I remember her having. Um, New Edition's first album. And so fast forward to seeing Bobby's commercial. It's like, I knew when I saw that, Gerald, I knew he was going to take this industry by force. He had that charismatic energy. He had that raw energy. And I loved Bobby Brown. I loved, I love Bobby Brown. I don't, you know, he was, he was very, he, very energetic. Um, you know, and um, I followed New Edition's career from the beginning. I followed Bobby's career from um, from 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 the beginning. And Bobby Brown is a testament of his own, despite the media stuff. I mean, look, you already know um, when um, someone is a musician, um, they're gonna they're gonna go through the media stuff. You, we 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 know this very well. The media stuff can work. For them and against them. But Bobby Brown, when I saw that commercial, I was like, what? Get out of here. And that was around the same time um, um, Full Force worked with Samantha Fox. Oh my goodness. I re- um I used to um walk by a record store in Richmond Hill, the Richmond Hill section of Queens on Liberty Avenue. Um they sold like mostly reggae. World records, um, um, world world beat, Afro beat, um, categories, and I remember seeing the post of Samantha Fox, because you know Samantha Fox was the sex pot from the UK, and um, some you know Samantha Fox made such impact in the um, I would I would say the hip hop industry. I'm not gonna I don't know. If, my R and B that that New Jack Swing, um, era, um, um, with with her, I want to have some fun, move my body all night long. It's like what? And when Ray Sean told me how um um Full Force was behind, her, I was like what? Because everybody was talking about Samantha Fox. I mean, you know, she made such an impact. You know. It even went all the way to the Cosby Show because it was episode Rudy. Rudy was listening. Rudy was listening. Rudy, Rudy knew the lyric that that lyric, 
Oh, I want, I want, I want to have some fun. Who, who my body all night long? Cliff had to stop Rudy from listening to that, um, knowing those lyrics. So you know how Samantha made an impact. Mm -hmm. I don't think we, we we don't really talk about her as much in this industry. And um, it was around the same time, um, Big Daddy came and Fall the MC mm -hmm. taking off their clothes. Right, that was. Big on um, Fall MC when Playgirl, and then you have Big Daddy Kane in Madonna's book Sex with Naomi Campbell. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. So the the New Jack Swing era, right? Um, took to I, I would say took took hip hop into to high school. Right, it definitely did. And if it wasn't for Five MC, wouldn't have these four guys from North Carolina by the name of Jodeci. Yeah, and you and we wouldn't have Mary J. No, we wouldn't have Mary J. And uh, I want to back up for a minute. You mentioned Samantha Fox and about how there was a cross pollinization between pop, R and B during that time. You also had freestyle, which is pretty much Latin R and B with a little bit of the salsa, the spice in it. You know, with expose, yes. TKA, yes. Sweet Sensation, Cover Girls, Stevie yes. B, Lanier. And about, we don't really talk about freestyle enough because freestyle, I think it was more of a regional sound. You pretty much heard it yeah. out west in LA, New York, probably in Miami, anywhere where there was a high pocket of, you know, our Latinx brothers and sisters that was yeah. really bumping and really grooving. And then also on the pop side, you had to give Paula Abdul her flowers. We don't talk about Paula Abdul Lever, her stuff that she did on herself, you know, with Forever Your Girl. Spellbound. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Marley Maul did a remix of Straight Up for Paul Abdul. Um, with the uh, oh freestyle, I grew up loving freestyle. Freestyle, it's like I um that was like one of, that was uh, one of my soundtracks of my life. Freestyle, they play freestyle on these black stations out here. Um, Kiss FM, WBLS. Um, I would I used to be in the car with my grandparents. We would go, um go food shopping, spending time with family and friends, and freestyle was always part of uh, my musical soundtrack. Um, the Point of No Return by Expose, one of my favorite songs in 1985. Um, I was going to Young People's Day Camp. That's, that's all another story there. Um, and I, we, I that was that was the summer song, The Point of No Return by Ex, Ex, Expose. Um, when Expose made the appearance on Showtime at the Apollo, the audience stood up. The audience jumped up and party, uh, especially um, Miss Miss Eva, Miss Eva Isaac, the woman who used to, who sat in the front. Um, when Expose came there, you already know the Cover Girls. All, um, oh my God, um, I'm thinking of um, um, Sweet Sweet Sensation, all of the um, Cynthia, all of those artists, and. We don't give um, and I think with the freestyle, um, I don't think people really give um, Joy Sims, rest in peace, rest in peace, and Shannon, yep, um, their props because I believe they were the founders. Yep, I believe they were the founders. Coming to my life, and I believe coming to my life, where Joy Sims was produced by Kurt Mantronics of Mantronics. Oh wow! Yep, fresh is the word Mantronics, but. You mentioned how when Expose was on Apollo and how if you were non-black going to Apollo, you better put it down because Apollo yeah. is a yeah. crucial audience yeah. and you're going to be booed off the stage if you didn't come up, show up, and show out. Now, on YouTube, there's the performance of New Kids on the Block with them doing the right stuff and Please Don't Go Girl at Apollo and how when they started doing the right stuff and started doing the oh, oh, oh dance. Of course, black folks know that's, that's from uh, Morris Day in the Time, Jungle Love, which they got it from Soul Train with it being the Funky Penguin. And the choreographer on the right stuff for New Kids was former Soul Train dancer, choreographer, the late, great Tyrone Proctor. Oh, really? Yeah, Tyrone, oh. Proctor, Tyrone Proctor was the choreographer New Kids for the, for the right stuff video. What? For balling the kid out of here? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, because I interviewed Danny Wood and he told me the story about, you know, the dance and how, you know, Tyrone Proctor said, like, no, 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 
this audience ain't never seen that dance. So once y'all do it, it's going to open up to the mainstream to a whole nother audience and how a generation of folks know that dance proxy through new kids on the block while those of us know it from Morris Day in the Time, Jungle Love, and Further right. Back Generation, Funky Penguin from Soul Train. So it all kind of makes sense and how we don't talk about what Maurice Starr did with them and how it was a black man that came right. up with the world's biggest pop group, which later yeah. spawned the boy band phenomenon in the late 90s, early 2000s, and also discovered the pop R&B group that's had an influence on every male R&B pop group in the past 40 plus years. You know, if it wasn't from Restart, we, no new edition, no new kids, and how the funny thing about new edition, they were put together in 78, but the Hollywood Talent Night Talent Show that Marie Starr discovered them in when they were performing wasn't until 81. Mm. And it didn't come out nationally with Candy Girl until 83. So they were already five years in, in season, yeah. before the world got to see them and hear them. And what they were able to do with the original five, then when Bobby got voted out with them as a four-piece for a short while, then them bringing Johnny Gill in, who was a solo artist in his own right, then coming mm. in to join a new edition for Heartbreak, and then the solo run with Ralph, Johnny, Bobby, BBD, and mm -hmm. how Mike went and discovered Boys to Men, and yes. how they're still standing, still strong. You know, they're currently in Vegas right now with their Vegas residency. So, what's mm -hmm. your what's your take on the impact, the influence of New Edition on the culture? And they also influence female groups as well, because if you go back and look at TLC styling, imaging, aesthetics, and coloring on ooh on the TLC tip, very much in the same vein of BBD. Um, new edition has been in my consciousness since I was six, seven years old. So again, I followed their career as a group, um, and through their solo careers, um, and like you just mentioned, their influence on other artists, um. You know, it, it it's like a it's like a um it's like a like a dynasty um because you 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 got okay new edition then new kids on the block and then perfect gentlemen um we they were short lived um unfortunately and then then then, then like you said Johnny coming in there and Johnny coming in there from perfect combination. With Stacey Ladder, so oh, I love that song when I was seven years old. Perfect combination. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know what it was. Um, I think I had a crush on somebody in the second grade. So that was my soundtrack for my crush that I had um in the second grade. I I love that song. Um so to see Johnny um joining New Edition gave, gave it another flavor. Um, he was already established, as you mentioned. He wasn't a new Jack. No pun intended. Um, he wasn't a new Jack. <laughs> um, he came in. He um, he blended so smoothly um, with um, with the um, with new edition. And then um, Michael Bibbins going out there and discovering Boys to Men and another bad creation. As Aisha was a thing. Aisha, <laughs> that song Aisha was a thing. I know on the jukebox network, the box. Yeah, another bad, another bad, another bad creation. And it's like, wow. It's like just to so just to see the transition, um, that 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 um that music soundtrack history from new edition, um, to to another two boys to men. And then, like you said, TLC giving their inspiration. So, New Edition. I'm happy New, New Edition is finally getting their flowers. Um, not because of the the miniseries helped. Yes, it did help. Yes, the miniseries helped. Bobby Brown's memoir helped. Uh, you know, but just to see what they went through as little boys, how um how they were taken advantage of. 
And I mean, they went through their personal um, trials and tribulations, but they're still here to tell the story. And that's what makes New Edition special and paramount because they're still here. All the members are still here. No one, no one overdosed. No one died. They're still here. And Bobby has, um, Bobby, and I believe who else was addicted? I believe it was Ricky. Ricky. They're still here. They're sober. They're here to tell it, and they look great. They, I know people talk about Bobby, but you know, I don't even talk about the way how he looks and everything. Because mo when when most people um um develop substance abuse issues and they we they um they get clean, yeah, the the body weight is going to change. We know that, you know, but I don't even I don't even pay attention to when the critics or the naysayers comment on his appearance. Look, he's here to tell it. He could have died. He could have dropped dead, but he decided he had to change. He wanted to change his life around. He wanted to deal with those demons. Mm -hmm. You know, however people say it, they're still here to tell it. And for uh, um, from a boy group to to um um a male an adult mature male group, that's extraordinary. Yes, they they went they separate. But they found they found their ways back together, and that's that that's telling. Yeah, it definitely is because most of that stuff would break anybody, break any group. But it's the love and the bond for each other, the fans and the legacy that they built over the forty plus years that still have them as standing. Because you mentioned the miniseries and how a lot of the stuff, at least from for me being a big New Edition fan, I didn't even know, and that's a testament that how tight they kept their business out there from not being posterized in the public to where we're gonna put this out we're gonna control right. the message we're we're gonna tell it and like you stated so eloquently they're still here to tell the tale yeah and, it's just, and I was think I was just thinking about a second ago I would I played um I played girls trip at the library I'm um I forgot to mention I am a librarian I'm a adult services librarian at Brooklyn Public Library, and I showed Girls Trip yesterday. I never watched Girls Trip until yesterday. I had my little issues at first because I was listening to other people's opinions in social media. Don't ever, I'm not ever doing that again. I'm gonna watch the stuff on my own, read the stuff on my own, and I'll make my own decision. Um, but um, um, when the um, when the when the ladies went to the Essence Festival. They had New Edition was there. New Edition was there among the other artists who were at the Essence Festival, I believe, when they taped it in 2016 or 2017, whenever they taped that movie, filmed that movie. The fact that New Edition was there. That's that's amazing. Right. You know, that's truly amazing. So I'm gonna always love New Edition. Um, and the and the thing with New Edition is the media. You know, the media tried to pit them against New Kids on the Block because of the racial issues. Uh, even though both groups were founded by the same Black man, um, Marie Starr. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's 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 ironic how you 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 brought up um, New Kids on the Block, Salt and Pepper, and Paul Abdul because every time they do their tours together, they're always on those same tours. Right, New kids on the block all have to salt and pepper, especially out here in um, New York City and Long Island. Yeah, because you know, New Kids on the Block, you know, interviewing Danny Wood and talking about New Edition, he's like, "We're the first to say if it wasn't for New Edition, no yeah. us, we were fans of New Edition before New Kids." And you know, Mike was talking about how you know the pop setup and the R and B setup. It's totally different because mm -hmm. new kids didn't go pop until pop radio got a hold of Please Don't Go Girl because originally they was marketed as an R&B group because they put out a low budget version of the Please Don't Go Girl video, which you probably only saw on New York Hot Tracks, Video Music Box, and BET, probably the box too. But it wasn't until pop radio called Columbia and was like, yo, you guys got a hit because a pop station out of Florida started playing it when the DJ started playing it on his own because they weren't even thinking about we're going to market pop. So once that buzz started going, Columbia said, well, we're going to go ahead and put you in 16 Tiger Beat 
all those teen magazines, get you on Disney mm -hmm. Channel, Nickelodeon, and mm -hmm. change the whole marketing strategy to where we're going to go pop, 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 pop. Yeah, I, I remember I had two I had two classmates at um St. Pi's fifth school. It was a Catholic school out in J Jamaica. Sonia and Sandra, they, they were cousins. They were huge fans of New Kids on the Block. I remember them. I remember them just talking about how they loved New Kids on the Block. And we're talking about 1990, 1989 going into 1990. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that New Kids on the Block, um, or well, what they were, um, and the fact that the, those two groups came out of Boston, mm -hmm. <laughs> given Boston's Boston, uh, racial racial history, it's pretty yeah. much like the South, yeah. but it's just more frigid. Yeah, you know, the and the, the with the um that whole racist bussing desegregation stuff, and how some of the the white parents they were just violent against the black kids desegregating the schools and just out of that those, those legacies and I would um Donnie and um um Mark Warburg um they did apologize years later of uh, having a certain mindset before they got they got famous you know because mm -hmm. they were living in Boston and new edition received the other end of the the rate the, the racial Right. stratification out in Boston, you know, right. being black and working class poor. Mm -hmm. You know, so they I would say both groups, they they turn lemons into lemonade, both of them, in different ways. Yeah, and to see new kids still standing still touring, selling out what Donnie was able to do to transition from music to acting, you know, putting out his brother Mark when he was a rapper, went by Marky Mark at the time, now he's a mm -hmm. well-established actor. Of course, John, mm -hmm. with what he's doing with real estate and his HGTV show, Farmhouse Fixer, Camp Renovator, Joey, this thing on Broadway, and what Jor Jordan and Danny are doing and how, like you mentioned, both groups had the same impact on their respective genres on pop, and on R&B, because it was until, you know, formerly disgraced music person, Lou Pearlman, um, rented a plane to new kids and said, hey, they making this much? I'm going to do this too. So he was like, let me create a group with new kids looks, but back, but boys to men sound. And mm -hmm. that's what became Backstreet Boys. And then he saw their success. Like, I'm going to try to see if I can get lightning to strike in the bottle twice. And that's how he came up with NSYNC. And then, of course, New Kids served as the template for Take That, which was the British equivalent to New Kids on the Block. And they gave us mm -hmm. international superstar Robbie Williams. Mm. I heard about Take That, but I, I there was a pen pal. I, 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 had a, I wrote to a pen pal in the UK, I think, once or twice. She wrote about Take That, but I, I never knew... I never, I never even knew this history until you, you're saying it, Jarrell. It's like you are such a wealth of information, and I love and I appreciate you for all of this. Um, I, I'm learning from you. Wow. Yeah, because take that. They were huge in their native UK and all over Europe, but they only had one hit here in the States, and it was Back for Good. Boys to Men ended up covering it years later. It was big on the AC charts to then take that and end up splitting maybe a couple of months later. Then Robbie Williams went on to have on his international solo career. And, you know, speaking of UK, I want to back up really quick and talk about just how huge George Michael was. George Michael in the late mid to late 80s, early 90s, you could not go anywhere without hearing him on pop, AC, R&B radio from his stuff with Wham to his solo stuff. Faith was actually the first album by a white artist to go number one on the R&B charts. And he won the American Music Award for Best Black Artist and I think Best mm -hmm. Black Album. That was mm -hmm. what the industry called R&B records. Then they mm -hmm. had called it the Black Charts. And it was yeah. backlash amongst some of us because it felt, okay, somebody's coming over doing our stuff better than us winning the awards why can't we have anything for ourselves and it was because of that heat 
That's why George Michael went and named his follow-up album to Faith, Listen Without Prejudice. I saw that, I saw that clip when he won, he won that American Music Award in that category. And Gladys Knight was talking about that actually. That's who was talking about um, that. Um, it's interesting, Gladys Knight talks about different things when it comes to different genres. Mm, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, you know, and this is, has been, and it's interesting um, about this history of the UK and R&B soul music um, because if it wasn't for if, if, if it wasn't for Army and Soul in this state over here, we wouldn't have had the Beatles. We would have not had the Rolling Stones. We would have never had any of these these British invasion groups. And the Beatles and the Rolling Stones have given the R&B Soul acts of the 50s and the 60s their, their credit. Um, and um, Billy, we know Billy Preston was a Interim Beatle? Yeah, they called him the fifth Beatle because he was around him so much and, and he was hanging around in production. So they consider Billy Preston pretty much the fifth Beatle. You know, and it's like, and then of course, then then, then of course, this that musical genre, Northern Soul. Mm -hmm. Northern Soul, yeah, all of this R and B music from across the across the the ocean, ac across the ocean or the pond or however they say it. It's like influencing each other, you know. But when it comes to George Michael, with that, you know, I I don't think it was really his fault with that. It was how the um I would say his label, I would say the industry, you know, because it's like that was the time of big crossover, and it's like these, you know. I mean, I just feel this whole musical, this whole musical being divided by race is stupid anyway. Because music is universal, mm -hmm. but when it comes to businesses, people want to stratify this group in one group and stratify the other group in this one group. And it's like it's music. Music is music. That's just my philosophy. But mm -hmm. I understand as far as the labels, you know, the the black music department, the black music this and the black music that, mm -hmm. and you know, and the fact is that you 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 got the cross pop. Um, how you said cross pollinization poly, uh, um, po pollinization of these mu these musical genres and it's like really um George Michael um and it's interesting also at that time yeah, yeah this is where I want to go so I'm gonna go there it's interesting how a lot of black radio have had black British invasion too we don't talk about that we don't talk about that a lot. We always talk about all oh, these black actors, these black British actors, and also I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm very passionate when I talk about this stuff. But it's like, wait a minute, but how about the black British groups that influenced black American musical culture? How about Lucens? How about Sade? How about the Cookie Crew? How about Junior? How about um Five Star, Fifty Second Street? Oh, five star and who else? Fifty second street. Fifty second street. Thank you, thank you. I was thinking, I was thinking about them the other day. It was a song that I loved by them. Fifty second street. Um, that slow song. Tell me and how I can't it feels. Think. Yes, you said fifty second street. Yep, thank you. I was thinking about it, Jarrell. I was thinking about it. And then you also had um musical you. Mm -hmm. Um, um, Princess. Lisa Paris. Princess. Soul to Soul. And Central Line. I didn't know Central Line was a Black British um, group until I I was listening to it a couple, like, over 10 years ago, and I'm looking it up, like, they are from England? And then you also had, um, of, course, of course, you had Billy Olsen, of course. You had Eddie Grant. Um, um, Soul to Soul. And you mean to tell, oh, and then of course, Shirley, Dame Shirley Bassey. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't, don't know she, 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 she's black. And I think also um, Cleo Lane. 
Hmm. And but this is what I don't. Oh, and I did not know about. I didn't know hot hot chocolate was from England. I, I thought they either. were from here. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I believe in miracles. You sexy thing. I was like, what? They're out there in England, and and I'm like, get out of here. You know, but all the you know, but we don't. I don't think we. I think I think some of us we don't pay attention to to that. It's like, yeah, they were from England too. So it's, all of these influences. Um, like I would say, the African diasporic influences. Okay, African Americans, Black British people, Black Caribbeans, all mm -hmm. of that. That's the African diasporic. That's Africa. Period. You know, we were just dropped off in different spaces and 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 places. Yeah. But the George Michael thing, um, it's I just think with that was you know and my grandmother listened, my grandparents listened to Wham and George Michael and all that stuff. Like I thought he was black. I thought he was black too. When I didn't see his face, this one's on a little boy. I thought he was black. Um, but just to you know, but just that the the way that the ladies do, I think late I think the ladies do that to start up stuff too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And also at that same time too, Culture Club, the police yes. was getting played yes. on RB radio as well. Yeah. Genesis, Phil Collins yes. was getting airplay on RB radio as well. But um, you had mentioned perfect combination earlier with uh Johnny Gill and Stacey Lottasaw. Believe that was written by Narada Michael Walden. And Narada Michael Walden, he worked with both the late Angela Bofield and Whitney Houston. And they were yeah. both signed to Arista. So can Ooh, we just talk yeah. about how Angela Bofield, how I felt after I saw her unsung, it felt like she had everything, but for some reason, never really got that push. Now, I could be wrong on this, but I think maybe Clive Davis might have saw like, hey, once Whitney hit, it was like, we're going to pour all our resources into her, and then everybody else kind of fell by the wayside because Whitney was... The Golden Goose for Arista. You know that when I saw Angela Bofield's um unsung, I was shocked because I had no clue prior to that. I had no clue what what label she was a part of. I I knew she was a, a recording artist. I didn't know she was with Clive, and I had a respect for Clive. But when I saw that, I was like, no. And when I heard when he did the Phyllis Hyman. He didn't want Phyllis Hyman to do anything. He didn't want her to do sophisticated ladies. He 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 wanted he wanted to mold these these his artists to this this these standards white white um whiteness standards um easy going music for for the white for um the white community the white upscale community. You know he he, he didn't want these artists to to sing how they wanted to sing. And that was the struggle he had with Phyllis and with Whitney as well. You know, but the fact that he discarded um, Phyllis um, and Angela for Whitney and the fact he tried to drive away between Phyllis and Angela. But see, this is what this is what these powers that be, this is what they do when mm -hmm. they want the divide and conquer mm -hmm. so that they don't want people to come together and say, you know what, we're both being exploited. We're both being screwed. They, you know, um, plant one thing in one person's ear and then plant the other stuff in another person's ear. He yes. knew very well Phyllis and Angela were friends, but the fact that he discarded them for Whitney, and no disrespect to Whitney at all, and it's sad, and I'm thinking about it, because they were, all, all three of them are gone, and Clive is still here. I'm just like, how? You know, this is no, no conspiracy theory, but just it's it's like, he he got rid of Phyllis and Angela for Whitney, and what, he controlled her sound for a long time until when she got booed at the Soul Train Awards, and Al Sharpton called her Whitey Houston. You know all that backlash Whitney received, right. and Whitney wanted to change her sound, wanted to be more street cred, talking about oh she was born in Newark and all that. She was not born in no in in no Newark. She was born in a in a suburb, but you know that she had to 
recreate herself to get the audience. But you know how that that is. Yeah, yeah. But wanna... yeah, Angela was. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just wanted to say this. You had mentioned the incident where Whitney got booed at the Soul Train Awards. I believe it was 87, 88, 89, somewhere around that time frame. It was right, yeah, it was right around when uh, the Whitney album had came out. It was 87. She had got booed. And then that was when Clive said, like, uh-oh, we might have went too pop with her. So that's why he went and got Ellie and Babyface for the I'm Your Baby Tonight album. But you can't fault Clive because Clive came from that era of the music industry where you're in this category, you're going to fit to this current demographic. Yeah. There's not going to be no cross-sectionalization of genres. No. And But when the debut came out for Whitney in 85, you had production by Kashif, songs written by Lala, and it was that yeah. perfect balance of yeah. pop, R&B. But what I felt happened was once they saw the pop numbers that she did, they're like, okay, we're going to go middle of America. Forget the black yeah. audience. Middle of America, yeah. middle of America, middle of America. Almost sort of the same situation with Aretha because Aretha Franklin originally was on Columbia. Columbia yeah. didn't know what to do with her. They had her no. doing standards, easy listening. And then it wasn't yeah. until she got to Atlanta with I'm an Eater Grimm and Dre Wexler that they yeah. really turned her loose. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I mean, Clive, like you said, Clive Davis was a, it was and is a man of his, of his time. You know, and it's it's the politics, not even him. It's just the the the, the label, the the executives who faces we don't even see. Right. Yeah, because Clive, you know, Clive is he's a figurehead, but the people who are above him we don't even see. You know, of right. course, you know this is what we're gonna do the different departments and all this stuff. But when it comes to Angela, yeah, they they don't. He didn't know what to do with Angela after um uh, um a point. Um, I don't even think he knew what market to um to, to promote her in. Do you promote her to to the Latin market? Do you do you, do you, do you, do you put her in the pop market? Do you put her in the R and B? I don't think it was really clear what he wanted to do. And I, you know, Angela should have been much further than what she yeah. was. Yeah, she should have. Because I didn't know. I try was originally done by her because I first heard it as a little kid through Will Downey's cover of I Trump. Mm. And I I I, re I remember hearing Angela Bofield's name on the radio. She was gonna be at these at these concerts. We're talking about 1985, 86, and I'm like, I always wonder who's this Angela Bofield? I didn't even know what she looked like. I remember when she was doing um a play, uh she was doing a play with Daddy Eagles. Oh, that's that's Angela Bofield. Oh, okay. Um, and then when I saw the the unsung, and I it was just sad how she suffered those two strokes, and I'm like, and then all of those the, the Angela Bofield experience, and it it was I cried when I watched the clip that was filmed by Relentless Aaron of um, Phyllis and Angela performing together at the Angela Bofield experience. And, um, you know, I think that was a time Phyllis had to let some, she had to, she received her catharsis because of the way she, she didn't blame Angela. She knew, she knew it, it wasn't from her. She knew it was from Arista, you know, and she just had to get some stuff out, but they, that made good show. Right. You yeah. know, and I think that was her closure with how Arista tried to divide her and Angela. Yeah, but it's crazy you think, you know, the 80s, it was a murderous row of female singers. You mentioned Angela Bofield, Phyllis Hyman, we got Anita Baker, Whitney, Sade, Mickey Howard, Jackie yes. McGee. We yes. go on and on. I mean, the female list of Stephanie Mills, the eight list of 80s female R&B singers, it was stacked. Allison yeah. Williams who sang a lot of backing vocals on a lot of those early hip-hop records. Fat Boys, yeah. If I Rule the World, I had a chance to interview her, and she was telling me a story about how she was there watching Def Jam from its infancy and just being on those records and just seeing hip-hop grow for where it is. And then also we just had um, Shaka Khan's Tiny Desk concert just recently, and one of the backing vocalists on that was Audrey Wheeler Downing, who is the wife of Will Downey and how wow. 
her along with Cindy Mizell, Lisa Fisher, Allison mm -hmm. Williams, these were the go-to singers where if I need some tight harmonies, backgrounds, they're going to be the ones that, that, that you're going to call. Now, I also want to talk about these two female R&B singers that you heard them all throughout the 80s through the 90s, um, Shirley Murdoch and Vesta. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Dive you in. Have, you may have to. You may have, you may have, I'm you may see me crying a little bit. Um, Shirley Murdoch's as, as as we lay. That's a, that has a special part of my heart because um they that played that song um my aunt Rogina when she got married. It was like, you know, you have that favorite aunt, she moves out because she gets married. Um, that was one of the songs that was played at our um um at the reception afterwards at the house. So it's like I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know it was a song about a woman with a married man. I didn't know it was that type of song. I just, you know, just associated this song with my aunt moving out to get married and everything. Um, that that that's a classic um rendition. Kelly Price's rendition of him. No disrespect to Kelly. I I prefer Shirley's. Shirley Murdoch's as we lay. That's the best as we lay to in my opinion. Um and we know Shirley Murdoch doing doing many gospel, regional gospel plays. Um I I feel Shirley Murdoch should have been more out there herself. Shirley had it. I don't really know too much of her background to see to figure out why she didn't get out there more than what she should have. Um Vesta Williams, oh my goodness. Vesta Williams was a powerhouse um, growing up. I mean, I'm seeing this heavyset woman singing her lungs out, dancing, animated, vibrant. Um, she was so self-assured about herself, very confident of herself. And, um, you know, I, I, I hear the songs, um, um congratulations and um um what's the other one oh, sweet God. sweet love once bitten twice shy um this is the other i think him in 86 what's the song it'll come it'll come it'll come it'll come to me um it, uh, and it's like I wanna I wanna know what that song is. I'm I'm a type of person. What is that song? It's not coming to me right now, but um but just just to see this vibrant woman, like she was doing it out there. And I found out years later, she did the women of Brewster Place um theme song. I was like, what? I didn't know. Her that vocals either. was so yeah. Her vocals were so strong. And um I was watching this, I was watching the um the the finale scene when the um when the um when the um the community um broke apart all of those bricks. Mm -hmm. And the the theme song, it was the theme song was more powerful at that that point. All of these those women in uh, those the community in, the, in that community blocked off from the other neighborhoods and they just started chipping and chipping and mm -hmm. it started raining and they they broke every brick and to hear Vesta sing that song mm -hmm. was amazing and and then we saw how she lost 100 pounds mm -hmm. um she 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 was a powerful they were both they were both powerhouses and she influenced to me she influenced um People like Kelly Price. She influenced Lizzo. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you have always had heavy set um heavy set um female musicians, but we're talking about in in that that R and B soul um world and well hip hop too. Mm -hmm. Like in the um in the modern like within the last thirty five years. Right, right, and we also got to give it up to Martha Wash too from the Weber Girls. Yeah, of course, of course. Right. Why am I not? Oh yeah, her and and the late Izora, I I Izora, Armstead. Rest mm -hmm. in peace, Izora. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, because oh, as... let's give a shout out to Stu Sylvester. Oh, let's yes, give a shout out yes, to yes, Stu yes, we gotta give a shout out but to even Sylvester. introducing us to Isora and Martha, right? And I was curious, have you seen the Cindy Lauper documentary that just came out? I need to see it, I need to see it. It is um, very, very good, and I didn't really know how inclusive she was at a time when you know the lgbtq plus ia community was very underground and how true colors became an anthem yeah. for them and yeah. this was right around the time when the aids epidemic was hit and how yeah. because of ignorance and the stigma at the time aids was looked at as a disease that only gay people you know could yeah. have and how she was open to including everybody and she said in the she bop video she had one of the actors in the video was uh, somebody that was trans before, you know, it was looked at as socially acceptable and how, you know, she really embraced that community with open arms when nobody wanted to embrace. And then we really saw the explosion of what that movement gave us once Paris is burning hit with Willie Ninja, Peppa La Beja, yeah. with yeah. Tutting, Whacking, and of course, Voguing. Then McDonough ended up taking that to mainstream. And if you go oh, look yeah. at Pose, great show. You really will understand the history of, you know, ballroom culture, the dance culture, and how a lot of those movements you still see today in modern dance. And that was all started by our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters. And you know, and and I'm happy that you brought um you brought up about LGBTQ plus same gender loving people because of the fact that um we have always been in that music we have always been in all of these spaces house house music yeah, too yeah we we go back to I mean we we go back to early R soul R and B in the twenties the Harlem Renaissance so you 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 know we didn't. You know, people like to think, okay, LGBT, 60s. Everything didn't just start in the 60s. The, the LGBTQ plus musicians were doing the Harlem Renaissance the 1920s. You had, you had people like um, Bessie Smith, Alberta Hunter, um, uh, and, um, um, and other, um, why am I, Ma Rainey, and other, 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 other black lesbian, black, bisexual. They didn't have the labels back then as mm-hmm. we know them now. Mm-hmm. But these women and men were so influential in many musical genres. You know, and, you know, people act like, oh, y'all just came again. No, no. People were in these um, in these um, industries for decades. And we're, fi- we're now finding out about Jackie Shane. She was a trans female musician, Jackie Shane. We find that we found people didn't find out about her the last two years. Mm-hmm. You know, so they, we have always been in these spaces. It's just that a lot of people just did not want to claim or recognize us. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it's even when Sylvester was out there. Um, making it, doing it so that everyone else could could come and fly after him. Sylvester risked everything. He risked his whole life and livelihood. You know? But he did it because if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have had Martha and Isaura, the Weather Girls, two tons of fun. Um, You wouldn't have not had these other Black people coming out and saying, okay, I'm a musician, I'm a rapper. Um, We've been in this industry for so long. Nona Hendrix is bisexual. You, you, Little Richard and all these other people. James, nobody wanted to hear it. James, J, James Cleveland. Even in that gospel world, we've been in these industries for so long. It's just that now that the histories are coming out. It's like what? Mm-hmm. It's almost like you were yeah. in the shadows, but now you got to okay to come in through the party, so to speak. Yeah, and it's like everybody's talking about um, Frank Ocean, and no disrespect to Frank Ocean and to Little Nas X, but how about those openly gay and lesbian rappers? You know, um, when Wendy wasn't outing, trying to out, they they were already out, and it's like 
they, you know, they started getting known um like the mid to late 20, um, 20, 20, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the mid to late 2000s. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, 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 it's interesting that they have, they have this space mm -hmm. now, but they were all, they were even in the beginning of hip hop. They were in all of these industries. Um, the, the rappers, the fashion designers, the PR people, um, the family members, the spouses, even the children, mm. um, the photographers, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not like we just came along within the last, um, 25, 30 years. We were always there. It's just that yeah. media just decided, okay, we, we don't want to, we don't want to say so-and-so is even gay. Cause mm. back then that was career suicide that, um, back then. Mm hmm. Yeah, because, you know, you have a lot of speculations about certain celebrities and, of course, it's their right to maintain that private and keep it hush hush. You know, if it's on you to want to reveal that, then that's on you, because that was one of the things that kind of played Luther Vandross up to his death, that there was always speculation of that. But, of course, title to his right to privacy to not reveal. So what was your take on Luther's career and how we're getting ready to have his documentary, Never Too Much, drop next year on, I believe, OWN and CNN, how Luther was a game changer in the music industry. And also at the same time, you had Freddie Jackson that was out popular doing this thing on Hush and I almost kind of felt like it really wasn't a rivalry but it kind of sort of read between the lines that there was only room for one I would say with Luther, Luther Vandross's journey was an interesting one because as we know he started off as a, a background singer um, and like like how his background his background singer Lisa Fit was Lisa Fisher um, he was on he was on Sesame Street um he was part of change, mm -hmm. you know. So he he came a long way, and he was singing background for for people like um, Donna Summer, Barbara Streisand, David um, Bowie. Yeah, David Bowie, and I believe sis, um, Sissy 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 Houston too, and she was a, a background singer as well. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, with her Think It Over <laughs> for her for her only disco hit Think It Over. Um, which a lot of the, the books about Sissy, they need she didn't even mention anything about 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 that, but you know, hey, everybody has their creative license. But yeah, Luther was a game changer because Luther was that crooner who people was like, um, he's singing all of these love making songs, having sex songs, these these sultry, intimate, quiet storm songs. And people have been wondering, what is he? How come we don't see him with a woman and all this stuff? Because it always has to go there. Um, you see these these popular male artists or female artists too, but these popular artists, who are they with? That's the first question. Who are they with? It's like it should be about the music, but we're in this celebrity culture. Everybody wants to know who everyone is sleeping with, who everyone is dating, who everyone is married to, mm -hmm. if if it if the spouse is black or white or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um and, <laughs> and I just think a lot of times, I just think that I just think that. When it came to Luther, I think that message was lost along the way. Mm -hmm. Instead of people just focusing on his music and now and how his music made people feel, people just wanted to always, oh, who was he with? Um, who what, what wasn't he with? Why isn't he with a woman? Uh, all that, all of those politics. Um, and the media did try to play him against Freddie Jackson. Um, these two heavy set men who were singing these love songs. Um primarily for straight people because nobody was thinking nobody was nobody cared about gay and lesbian people because marriage equality wasn't existing at that time nobody nobody even thought um that the sanctity of gay marriage was even something serious for people to even inquire with so as far as they were concerned yeah he's singing for him and freddie are singing for gay no for straight people you know <laughs> um and it's like, yeah, Luther, Luther and Freddie, very private. Um, and um, you know, Luther's weight loss journeys, all of this stuff. Um, you know, he 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 would jump up, um, his weight would jump up and down. And when he lost that weight, he lost a lot of significant amount of weight. I remember, I think he was on, um, I want, I'm gonna say maybe the NWCP Image Awards or the Essence. I think he was on the Essence um Awards. I think 
or it was either one of those awards, the Essence Awards or the NWCP Image Awards. He lost a lot of weight. People, people wondering, was he sick? You know, did he have the, um, HIV? That's what people were really wondering because he lost so much weight. And I'm like, why can't a person just lose weight just to lose weight? You know, but you, you got some people, when they see you, when they see you looking a certain way for the majority of your life, that's the images that people are used to seeing. But when you start to alter and change your um your weight, oh, you must be sick. You must be on drugs. And it's like, wow. Um, but Luther, Luther Vandross um is such a was is a phenomenal legend. Um I can't wait to see his documentary. And um I I I read his Biography by Craig Seymour. I, I I have it here in that library that you see right in the back of me. Um, Luther Vandross has been a huge part of my musical soundtrack, and there's never there's not going to be another one. Um, um, there's not going to be another Luther ever in this life. Um, as far as his um, private life, people got mad at Patti LaBelle for outing him. She outed him on. Um, Wait, watch what happens next. With Andy Cohen. Yeah. And I'm like, I love Patty. Patty, Patty, I love her. I don't feel it was Patty, Patty's place to out him like um like that. I don't think that was her place. I mean, I love her. I love her the fact that she's been loved. She's been loved by black gay people, you know, and she's been a she's been an important ally. To black gays and uh, to black black gays and lesbians, mm. but I just didn't feel that that was her place to out someone. That just wasn't her, um her place. Yeah, kind of like how you mentioned, we live in a tabloid gossip era where everybody wants to know who did what, who did who, and how you mentioned Wendy Williams earlier. How you know she was dishing dirt on folks, and you know some celebrities had to check her on that because she was revealing information that was supposed to be confidential and not being broadcast for everybody to know and about how it's your right to maintain your privacy. You also got to know when you sign up to become a public figure, you kind of give up some of that, but it's all about what you want to share with the right. public. You can control the message. No longer do you need a PR firm to control your message for you. You can go direct to the people, just like how we are now, and yeah. just tell the story straight from the horse's mouth, which was very surprising for me that a couple of years ago, Janet had did that documentary because Janet is very notoriously private about her private life, yeah. keeping her stuff hush-hush. So yeah. it was very surprising that she agreed to do that, and it was also surprising for me that towards the end of Prince's life, Prince was working on the memoir, and when it came out, I got it and read it. And for me, it felt like he was trying to open up, but it was a little too late because Prince was one of those ones where him and Michael Jackson, too, got to give them two credit because they were in an industry oh, yeah. that's not set up for us to yeah. win. And yeah. they were both saying, hey, if you this, yeah. these are the rules to the game. This yeah. is how they're going to trick you. This is how you're going to get jerked over. This is what mm -hmm. you need to do to make sure that you're not going to get jerked over. And that's also what you can appreciate about what the late great Clarence Avant did too, where he would school a lot of you know black executives coming into the business about how not to get jerked around by the business because the business can jerk you around if you let it, if you don't know the business, because it's business first, show second. Yeah, and um, it's interesting you brought up both Michael and Prince. I mean, yeah, I mean, I brought Michael Jackson first, but Michael Jackson, <laughs> MJ, MJ has been upsetting people for so long. As I still, I still feel that um, the powers that be couldn't stand Michael Jackson's I tried to post up the magazine covers that I could find about his death on my Facebook page. I got, I don't know, somebody maybe reported me, but they took my stuff down. And I said, somebody at Facebook probably had an issue with Michael. Because I put up stuff about Farrah. Nobody took anything down about Farrah. 
And I use magazine covers and everything. Nobody took nothing down about foul fourth. But when I posted up myself about Michael Jackson, that stuff was taken down. Michael Jackson, you know, Michael Jackson um, was gangster in a lot of ways. You know, people looked at this image of him, the, the low voice, the shyness, the eccentricity, um, the quote unquote weirdness. And they, they, they didn't think uh, it was a smart, calculating, intelligent man behind all of that. Um, avid reader. He had what? He had 10,000 books in his personal library. You know, so he, he, he was a mind fuck for such a long time. The fact that he, um, the fact that he, he bought out the Beatles catalog, the fact that he bought out Eminem stuff, and, and the fact that he got MTV to integrate their, their music videos. Because MTV was not trying to feature any one of us. I mean, okay, they may have played Miss Kitties because they were from England. They were not from, they were little boys from England who they didn't know, they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't have anyone advocating for them. They didn't have anybody doing their, they didn't do their homework because they didn't know how. They were little kids, exploited. But the black artist, um, well, him and Rick James went, lit up MTV's ass and say, okay, like, what's up with that? David Bowie. David mm -hmm. Bowie said, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, so I just think the powers that be always have had it for Michael Jackson for a long time because he changed the game. He changed, um, he influenced the industry in many a bigger ways. And when he came after Sony, going after Tommy Mottola, mm -hmm. and went to the National Action Network, with mm -hmm. Reverend Al, Al Sharpton, mm -hmm. Michael Jackson, they couldn't stand Michael, Michael Jackson. So you had these media pundits, Nancy Grace, um, Diane Diamond, Martin Brashear, gonna, gonna say things about him, calling him wacko jacko and all that stuff. It's like, really? But, but they had to call him names. They couldn't say it into his face because he would outsmart all of them. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, when people can't say what they want to in your face, they got to call you names, call you in the media, you this, you that, because they can't, they didn't have the bravery to come into Mike, Michael's face and right. say what it is they needed to say to Michael. But for him to go after Tommy Matola, mm -hmm. Michael Jackson, Prince, you know, Prince, Prince was, Prince was an enigma in its, in himself. And I'm thinking about the 40th anniversary of Purple Rain. I saw that with my grandparents in the movie did. I was seven. Um, it was what it was. Um, I watched it as an adult years later. I was like, oh, okay, that's what Purple Rain is about. Prince changed a lot of sexual boundaries, gender boundaries. He was, he, he was like one of those, he was, I'm going to say like one, I'm not going to say the earliest. He was one of the many black gender benders. You know, man dressing up in um, sexy, sexually provocative clothing and just out there, just androgynous show. look. Yes, yeah, very androgynous. Just giving off that energy, like letting black people know, okay, you if you, you it's okay to express your sexuality in health healthy ways. You can be a you can be a so called they say a freak. You know, Rick James was saying the same thing too. I mean, him and Rick James, they had their difference, but Prince, um, I and I and I think I may could be wrong here. I think Prince was kind of allowed that because um, we don't, a lot of us want to talk about it, but colorism, I think he was given more of a leeway because he was lighter. You know, that's part of the conversation too. Um, but not to take away from his musical, he was a musical, musical genius and he started to wise up about the industry. He started to wise up. And I think at the end of his life, because you saw he was growing his Afro, it was going back to his roots. Mm -hmm. And I just think when people start seeing, okay, you start you starting to do the healing work. You you you. I don't know. I don't want to say conspiracy theories, but uh, right. he just became his message became. He he grew up. His message started to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because um, Nas had told a story about he wanted to collaborate with Prince. Prince called him and Prince asked him, did he own his masters? Nas said, no. Prince said, I can't work for you then if you don't own your masters. And that was that. So they were championing, you know, ownership, publishing, own your stuff. Michael Jackson too, own your stuff. Because I believe it was a story where one of the pioneers of rock and roll, I can't recall which one it was, had gotten their publishing taken. Michael ended up buying the publishing from whoever had it originally and reverted it back to the original owner of the publishing. And then he also paid for medical bills for, I believe it was either Gene Kelly or Fred Astaire once he got word that, you know, they were sick because he found out that they had pawned off their dance shoes to pay for medical bills. He ended up finding out about it, buying back the shoes and hmm. reverting it back. So, you know, it's all about knowing the business, champion, supporting what was going on. Now, I want to shift back to hip-hop for a minute. Um, what was your take when you first heard all the rap that was coming out of the West Coast? Because, you know, this was back during the time where, as we stated earlier in this interview, that rap was very regionalized, where you rarely heard rap outside of New York on New York radio and vice versa. But once... West Coast hip hop started to break around 92, 93 with Dr. Dre and Snoop and everything that came on after that. That was where a lot of West Coast hip hop was getting played beyond the West Coast. So what was your take when you first heard Dr. Dre, The Chronic, Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style, Warren G, and all those acts that was coming out of uh, Southern California, Ice Cube? I love, I loved all of them. I loved all of them. Um, watching the music videos, especially on the Jukebox Network, I gotta give I gotta give homage to the Jukebox Network. Video Soul. I forgot to mention Video Soul with Donnie Sampson. Rap City. Yo, MTV Rap. But just hearing these, hearing the West Coast acts, NWA, Dr. J, Snoop, HWA, holes with an attitude. We forgot about them too. They they don't get the flowers. Holes with an attitude. <laughs> oh my god. They were they were just raunchy. Um JJ Fad. Um, Easy E. I love all of them. Roaring G, Nate Dogg. Um, oh, Yo Yo. Oh my God, I love, I love all of them. You know, and I and I want to say this because um, there are some people who don't think they they don't think I know anything about about hip hop rap. They think I don't know. How how is it that I don't know? I grew up. I grew up. I'm I'm a generation X. Um I'm considered I'm considered a part of the hip hop generation. Um there's some hip hop um sociologists who um critics who say if you were born between the years 1965 and 19 um I believe 84 you're part of the hip hop generation. So I'm part of the hip hop generation cuz I was born in 77. Um, so I'm, you know, I I loved it. I, I didn't have an issue with it. I mean, I understood what the controversies were because the industry named the gangster rap. They didn't say it was gangster rap. They did not say, oh, we're gonna do gangster rap. They didn't say that. That mm -hmm. was from the industry. I understand the the, the issues about the lyrics, um, the violence, misogyny, misogynoir, ho homophobia. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, and then the fact that NWA um, was uh, was founded by Jerry Heller, a white man, you know, so that 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 says a lot. I mean, but a lot of these labels were founded by white men and white women. You know, we get that. We get that. We just see the figureheads, mm -hmm. you know. But again, you guys see who's on the top, mm -hmm. who's on the top of the boards. People don't see, but. I love their music. I still do love their music. I mean, I don't agree with Dr. Dre beating up on women. That's the part when he beat yeah. up um, D. D Barnes. Barnes. Um, from Pump yeah, it I used up. to love Pump it Up. Oh, Pump It Up. That's one shot. Yeah, Pump It Up on Saturday nights at one out here in New York, 1 o'clock in the morning when Showtime at, at the Apollo was on NBC Channel 4 out here. I would When I got bored with Showtime at, at the Apollo, I would turn to watch Pump It Up. I loved it. D Barnes, but I that's the part I didn't agree with. I didn't agree with Dr. Dre beating up on her and other women. Um, 
And of course, got to know, got to know about Ice T, you know, Ice Cube, all, all those acts out there, Yo Yo, the Lady of Rage. Um, and I know there's a lot of other people who I'm forget. Oh, and two shorts. Mm, shout out to the Bay Area, E40 G's, and of course, MC Hammer from the yeah, Bay Area. M MC Hammer, of of course. Um, um, and I know there's a lot of other people who I'm forgetting right now. Um, but that that I feel I feel that these every coast has musical histories, and I really feel that um their musicologies need to be evaluated more, discussed more. You know, the, the um every region has their stories. Mm -hmm. Um, the East Coast we have our stories. West Coast has theirs. The Dirty South has their stories. Um, and the um the 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 Midwest rap like with with like with Nelly they have their own stories every region has their own stories every country has their own stories because hip hop is universal mm -hmm. you know hip hop is very universal right and like you mentioned how each region has their own story and that what to me is the beauty about rap and hip hop that it allowed it to flourish cuz i can remember yeah. um when seven player list of Cadillac music by outcast came out in 94 i was eight going on nine at the time, but how it was a big deal that you have a Southern rap back to really come out on a national scale. And when he went on to the Source Awards and said, the South got something to say, and South is still saying it and how Atlanta now is the Mecca yeah. for, for music. If you don't want to go to New York, you don't want to go to LA, you go to Atlanta, you know, with, what LaFace started. Um, actually, S West Band kind of kicked that off because they were from Atlanta. And then you had them, you had LaFace, JD and So So Def, Wolf to later come with Disturbing the Peace, Shaka Zulu, Ludacris, all of them, and T.I. and everybody that came out of that Atlanta hip hop scene, Little John, and how, you know, Atlanta really changed the forefront of hip hop and it gave the South, to me, being a fellow Southerner, respect and injury. Because you had yeah. other areas in the South that was doing their thing musically. You know, Houston with uh, Rap-A-Lot, Jay Prince, and Swab House. And then you had Memphis with what they had going on with A Ball, MJG, 3-6 Mafia. Then was later come out of VA with Neptunes, Missy, Timberland, and later to come out of my home state of North Carolina with Little Brother, Rhapsody, J. Cole, Petey Pablo. But Atlanta really kicked off for the South, too. What really took in, in place for hip-hop, but also, too, we got to give Uncle Lucas flowers down yes. in Miami. Yes. Uncle Luke, Luke yes. Records. How if it was for him fighting the Supreme Court, or nasty oh, as they yeah. want to be, oh, yeah. we would not have the right to say all of the stuff that we could say today, you know, with, like I said, Luke Records, and if it wasn't for Luke Records, no H-Town. Um, of course, no Luke Records, there probably wouldn't be a slip and slide, you know, no Trick Daddy, no Trina, no Rick Ross, no Pitbull, no Flo Rida, all the rap acts that came out of Florida since, but, you know, we definitely got to give Uncle Luke you know, his father was Uncle Luke, more than just Captain D coming, Pop That P, Me So Horny. He's the one that stood up and said, I'm going to be as nasty as I want to be, whether you like it or not, and you're not going to constrict what I'm going to say. You know, and I remember I remember that taking place because my grandparents and I, we, we were like very, see, this is what I live for all this, talking about this entertainment music stuff i've been i've been talking about this stuff since i was a little kid so i am enjoying our conversation together um i remember when that was taking place um it was all on the news uh <laughs> uncle luke two live crew um fighting the u.s supreme court for freedom of speech and um i remember they celebrated it in the song born in the usa i remember that mm -hmm. um <laughs> and I believe they got support from Larry Flint, the founder of Hustler Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I remember hearing that. You know, he supported he supported their fight because right. he, he had to go do the same thing when it came to distributing 
adult entertainment publications. Mm-hmm. I I believe I I read, I read that somewhere, but yeah. um yeah they changed the game um he, uh, despite C De- C Delores Tucker outlaw running outlaw all right and I understand where C Delores C Tucker was coming from mm-hmm. but but I I know she was from um I believe she was from I think she was from the Black Baptist Church or something like that mm-hmm. I think she was a religious she was a religious. Right. activists as well i i get that um i just think i just think even with her i just think that she wasn't gonna out she wasn't gonna outlaw rock music mm-hmm. why why were you outlawing just rap mm-hmm. you know but that goes again to rap being seen as negative because it's from a grassroots black space mm-hmm. black root black black root, grassroots Black spaces and telling the stories of black people who are marginalized. Let let's be real. Let's be clear about that because right. these early voices they were marginalized right. in their region, disenfranchised, going through racial stuff all the time. Um, no money, no employment. There's different things coming right. up, and rap, hip hop was that outlet for those men, women, and children. Right. Yeah, it was because if you go back and listen to the message, it was a breath of fresh air at the time because all rap prior to that was party, I riding my yeah. Def OJ, watching this, playing basketball, like the party and BS. But when the message yeah. came out, it was something of substance talking about the harsh realities or growing up, once again, this was pre-gentrified New York, not the New York you see today, but back when they had the peep shows at Times Square. But, oh, yeah, um, yeah. And also, out on the West Coast, you had Captain Rap, Bad Times, I Can't Stand It, which was one of the early productions of Jam and Lewis. Then you had Toddy T, Batteram, Ice T, Six in the Morning, talking about the realities of where they come from, NWA, and what they were talking about in the of Compton, they were speaking to the realities of where they came from in Public Enemy, was Chuck D labeled rap as the black CNN. You know, and with the and with the, I was just thinking about when um when um the West Coast acts were talking about their story. And see, you know, when rap rap went through, I would say rap went through child its childhood, the 80s, that was the childhood. Um mm-hmm. going into jun- junior high, that was the 80s, I, I would say the 80s. Um mm-hmm. Elementary, junior high, then in the nine, coming to the nineties with the uh, New Jack Swing going into high school. So when rap was going through its child, its adolescence, um, that was still a time that was Reaganomics. That was Reaganomics, the Ronald Reagan administration, and they really did not want to hear any stories about the black underclass, as they say, you know. So all of this music was coming out during that time in which. Okay, if you want to be heard, you got you can't be complaining. You can't be complaining about anything. That's why the Cosby Show was a success for eight seasons. That's another conversation, but you got to be like the Huxtables. So, rap was it, with this with that in the background. Mm-hmm. These stories of these rappers, the 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 mainstream people really did not want to hear that. I don't want to. I don't want to hear that. Mm-hmm. You know, we want. I want to have that American dream. I wanna, I wanna get what Ronald Reagan is trying to get, you know. The whole, I wanna get that money. Mm-hmm. I wanna, I wanna get my credit cards and spin up everything. That's why this country is the way it is. All of them. Yeah, I wanna be People's, the one to get picked. Please. Yeah, I wanna be the one to be to be picked. And if you, y'all in the background, y'all making a bunch of noise. Mm-hmm. But now some of the, the children of those middle class. A working class black parents or Latinx. Oh, well, I like that. Yeah, because y'all you found y'all found out mm-hmm. y'all found out what the rappers were trying to say was true. Mm-hmm. Y'all yep. found out y'all didn't get the American dream. Y'all had recessions, Ponzi schemes, all the stuff happening. Your money wiped out from the bank, mm-hmm. or the person that you voted for betrayed you politically. Mm-hmm. So everybody had, everyone had 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 and had their stories. Yep. So pretty much, you found out you got the no Vaseline treatment. 
Yeah, yeah, no Vaseline. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Ice Cube for for, yes. for, that, for that classic. Now the thing about Ice Cube <laughs> in America's Most Wanted record, he actually went to New York to go work with the Bomb Squad on that album. You know, Bomb Squad, Public Enemies production. If it wasn't for Bomb Squad, we wouldn't have Poison by BBD because BBD they wanted that hard street hip hop sound because they wanted mm -hmm. to break away from the image and the sounds yeah. of New Edition. And when Poison came out, it was refreshing because it mm -hmm. was new. It was a new look for them. You're like, oh, these are the same three guys from New Edition? And it became a big smash. Now, I don't know if you know this about BBD, but you know, I Want to Sex You Up was originally for BBD and not for Call Me Bad. Oh my goodness, Jarrell. We must be Cosmic Twins. I was just thinking about Pulling me bad off seconds ago. I was just thinking about them in, in my head. I'm glad that you just brought them up. I was just literally thinking about them because I was thinking about how we we transitioned from the 80s into the 90s. Mm -hmm. Color me bad, Jane Child, Tara mm -hmm. Kemp. They were coming mm -hmm. up in there too, but color me bad. I mm -hmm. did not know that was for um BBD. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because I interviewed uh KT from Color Me Bad and he shared with me that that was originally for BBD. But they passed. Of course, that was produced by Spider Man, Doctor Freeze, and it became a big hit for Color Me Bad. So much so to where when they were recording it for Giant, and it was on the New Jack City soundtrack, people were buying the single and not the soundtrack, and that put Cassandra Mills the press on them to say, "Hey, you guys got to get in the studio, cut an album, so we can capitalize on it." And that came the CMB album. Now, when you think about Color Me Bad's sound and style, they quoted it as doo-wop hip-hop. And you can also put Boys to Men kind of in that category as well because they were doing yeah. the same sound, same yeah. styling. Both groups, descendants of the Foursome Ds, originally Foursome Cs. But when I think of Color Me Bad's sound, I kind of hear a lot of those Jersey under the street walk under the lamppost groups like Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, yeah. a lot of those groups, you can yeah. hear that tone and that influence in Color Me Bad's vocals and stylings. And I want to set I, you up. Number two biggest song of yes. 1991, Brian's Items, Everything I Do, I Do It For You was the number one song of that year. But man, Color Me Bad was, was no slouches. No, there was no, they were no slouches. I mean... I believe they was on the Apollo too. Yep, Color Me Miss Bad Eva. was Apollo, Miss Eva. And uh, also with Color Me Bad, <laughs> that sample Tonight's Tonight by Betty Wright. I think yes. Betty, we don't talk about her enough. No. Even the late, great Betty Wright. I mean, be, being from the South, her music, Millie Jackson, Clarence Carter, uh -huh. Tyrone Davis, Marvin Cease, that whole Southern soul movement really set the stage for your backyard gatherings for the families down there. But how mm -hmm. it was pretty much taking what was done with the Chitlin Circuit and how you could make a good living as a Southern Soul artist touring those Southern states with those records. Because, I mean, some of those acts that are still out and about are still touring and making money to this day. But how Betty Wright was first said, I think she ended up suing um, the producers for Sexual Up because this was back when samples weren't getting cleared and it was still the Wild Wild West and yeah. how you know she ended up suing. Then also too, Candyman knocking the boots sampled tonight's night by Betty Wright as well, and that came out I believe the same year that uh, I Want to Sex You Up did ninety one. Oh, um, I was just thinking about Clarence Carter. And um, Marvin Cease, because I my mother's family is from South Carolina. Oh, what part? Uh, oh, um, Dar Darlington, Florence, something. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got family out there. Yeah, my, yeah, my family's uh in the Columbia area, and my stepmom is from uh, Florence. So yeah, I got uh some South South Carolina ties. Got family out there. Yeah, Lee County. Okay, Lee County and um. Lawrence County, Darlington County. Okay. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, but that Southern Soul is just a whole nother vibe. For some, it's an acquired taste, but others, you know, like myself, it just made me think about home and Miller Genuine Draft Gold Cans. 
before they get broken mm. out along with the bicycle <laughs> deck of cards. That's when you knew as a kid it was your cue to go into that back room as soon as you heard Johnny Taylor talking about Jody. Oh, yeah. Johnny Taylor. <laughs> Johnny Taylor. I, 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 was with, I, I was with my mother somewhere and she was playing those songs with, I think my, my, with my cousin Joanne. Joanne plays a lot of blues in her apartment in um in co-op co city in the Bronx. Mm. Um but it's it's just amazing how Millie Jackson influenced Little Kim. Mm hmm No Mill influenced her. Yeah, Millie Jackson, you know, influenced, you know, wouldn't be no little Kim, no Cardi B, no Megan the Stallion. Because when you think about when they put out WAP, I was like, yeah. okay. Millie Jackson was doing that <laughs> beforehand and those prior to her. And then, you know, and I thought back, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, put it in your mouth was considered obscene, you know, with Akinelli. But when WAP yeah. came out, that made put it in your mouth sound like, forgive me for saying it, Sunday service. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and what, what Millie Jackson did with Fuck You um, Symphony. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that song, I'm sure, probably got told to a lot of people who decided to quit a job that they didn't like. And, you know, her daughter was an artist in her own right. She put out her own album, I say, 91, 92. She had the record Mama Told Me. Very much heavy in the same vein of New Jack Swing because New Jack Swing was out and heavy and popular at the time. And then I want to go into this before we close. Um, as you know, Millie Vanilli is gaining a resurgence with the release of their documentary that just dropped and seeing how people are now getting famous for lip syncing and how it was considered, of course, taboo when Millie Vanilli got exposed and how now they're coming out with a movie, I believe in August, about everything that it went through and how, you know, the streams and everything for Millie Vanilli ended up going up once the documentary came out. So can you express your thoughts on seeing the resurgence of Millie Vanilli and how it was almost looked at as they were taken advantage of by uh, Frank Frank Morvan, Frank, not Frank Morvan, Frank Farian, that was the producer, taken advantage of by them. And, you know, it was, it was a sad story, but it's good to see Fab out kicking, still standing and telling his truth. Um, I'm glad there's a resurgence of their story because when um they were exposed, we got the we got the one sided narrative that these two black men purposely did that. That was a narrative we got. Um, we didn't really know too much about the the producer's role in in that, you know, and it's and it's like. It's like to see these two black men um, from Germany going through that that public humiliation, you know, because when you you, you look at um, the mainstream press, it's as if they were being deceitful on their own, you know. But when you're connect, when you're tied down to a contract, you're gonna do what pretty much the label wants you to do. So we didn't know that aspect until now. So I'm I'm happy that. I'm happy that all of the stories are coming out um, about M Millie Vanilli. I like them, you know. I did too. I I like I love them. They were refreshing. Um, they were big on 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 TV. I remember, I remember the Grammys. Um, I think it was the 1988 or 89. I think the 89 Grammys. I believe Anita Baker. Um, was she? She was a she was she was a presenter, and she presented Millie Vanilli. It wasn't the American Music Awards. I don't think so. I think it was the Grammys. It was either that or American Music. Anyway, she presented them, and they came on the stage. They did what they did, and that was that. And when they guest stopped, they did a cameo on um this short lived sitcom. A lot of people forgot about Sister Kate. That was with Stephanie Beecham, who was Sable Colby on the Colbys and Dynasty. She played a nun, and uh, this nun was running this orphanage with these badass kids. Uh, <laughs> um, and Millie Vanilli made a cameo appearance on it, 
that was that was um 1989 going into 1990 um but they they were huge and then the scandal happened so i'm happy that we, we're getting all of these sides to their story because i don't I, I mean they they was a behind the music several years ago with um Who's the one that's living? Is that some um, that's Fab, right? Fab. Yeah, Fab is Fab, Fab is still living. Rob and um had passed away. Yeah, yeah, Fab. They got Fab's side of the story. Because Rob Rob ended up committing suicide. So they did the behind the VH1 did the behind the music. It was what it was, but I'm happy that this story is fully coming out with brand new additional narratives. Cause think that was the only narrative we were getting that these two deceitful black men were what were, were deceiving everybody. Right. You know, this is you, this is how the media does. They paint up storylines for stuff, but we're not really getting co the complete backstory. So I'm you know I'm, I'm happy that their story is finally being um told to a wider audience thanks on social media. Mm -hmm. And Blame It on the Rain was one of Diane Warren's earlier early hits, you know, that ended up going to Millie Vanilli. And Millie Vanilli was huge. I mean, they ended up winning the Grammy for Best New Artist that year. Of course, it got yeah. rescinded once everything came out with the lip syncing scandal. And then also, too, right after that happened, you had everything that happened with uh, CNC Music Factory because, you know, it was a yes. common practice yes. at that time, linking it back to Martha Wash, that yes. it was a common practice. To where you don't have a supermodel in the video lip sync, but you have somebody else do the vocals, and you know I think she ended up suing, and ended yeah. up ended up winning, and ended up getting credit on the record to where it would say CNC Factory vocals by Martha Wash. Everybody yes. dance now, going to make you sweat. And how she like? No, you're going to respect me. I know my worth. You're not going to make me sign this contract, take my money up front, and I'm not going to eat from it. And how right. now to see where that's not even an issue anymore, where, like you mentioned, Lizzo and everybody who's of the plus size community to where you can be out in front, out on the camera, and not have to worry about, we're going to replace you in the video for a model or someone that has a slim, thin look. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about um, everybody, everybody, because I remember I remember hearing everybody, everybody at a family reunion of my on my grandmother's side of the family, and it was a Saturday, and that that song was being played repeatedly. That was the summer of nineteen ninety, mm -hmm. I would I believe nineteen ninety, and mm -hmm. um, but nobody had a clue that, um, but we I it was something because they were on Soul Train. And Don Cornelius was interviewing um them, but the the woman who we saw in, who we saw in the video, she 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 didn't speak English. I was like, what? That was Martha Wash too. Oh yeah, talking about um black box. Everybody, everybody, yeah. strike it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm like, and I saw it on Soul Train. The woman could could you speak English? I was like, what? She she had switch. her she she had her interpreter right on Soul Train. I was like, what? That's wild. That's crazy. Now I don't know if you've seen Celine Dion's documentary yet about um I am Celine Dion. I don't know if you've seen it yet. I want I, I want to see. I want to I want to I want to see that too. Very good. Now with Celine, I felt they could have marketed her towards the R and B market if they wanted to but I think yeah. she knew like the David Foster, Diane Warren ballads on my bread and butter but vocally she could go there if she wants to but for her to be left off that 200 greatest vocalist list that Rolling Stone put out a couple years ago travesty because Celine Dion got pipes yeah I don't know I don't know I don't know what the heck Can I don't know if I can curse on here yes you uh, can I don't know what the fuck um, Rolling Stone was thinking about. The Rolling Stone with its own editor-in-chief with his racism. Yeah, I'm a winner. Not a winner there. With his there. racism. It's like, how you gonna you, how you gonna omit Celine Dion, really? Celine Dion is one of the most fabulous voices 
She has those pipes. I don't know what the Rolling Stone was thinking about. But to, for her to have been included on the first VH1 Divas, really? They're not just going to put anybody up on those Divas. Nope. Nope. You, you gotta, Even though you she was trying play. to outsing Aretha. That's the only part I ain't like. You, you're not going to outsing Re. You're not going to do that, Celine. Nope. Mm -mm. nope. She nope. tried it, though. No, I felt bad for Carol King when I saw that clip. I'm like, she just barely got the front first, and they just put the ball out the hand. Almost did like what Carlton did to Will and <laughs> Fresh Prince, where he tried to yeah. throw the ball to make the game. It, it was like, no, we're gonna play ISO ball this whole game. ISO dribble, 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 dribble. Just give me the ball and just let me cook. Now there was another <laughs> clip. It was '87 at the first Soul Train Music Awards. It was Stevie Wonder. Dion Ward, Luther Vandross, and Whitney Houston. They were all singing That's What Friends Are For. And it was the clip where it was a part where Luther and Whitney were singing separately, but almost they were kind of sort of doing it in like a competition. Well, Luther kind of gave Whitney that look when she hit her nose, like, oh, you want to play, huh? Watch this. Mm -hmm. Then Luther <laughs> did that. Everybody like, ah. I, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the one thing about those old school singers. They, they didn't come to play in... Uh, Auntie no. Dion lets you know on social media that she hears for the action. She's here for it. Every last bit of yeah. it. Yeah, and that, that happened the same, similar to her, Gladys and Patty, when they did um Superwoman. Who was this? Gladys, Patty, and Dion Ward? Dion. Uh huh. Nah, when they did they, a version they, of Superwoman, they had enough microphones to go around. I think Dia probably, probably got it last because you got Patty and uh, who was the and you said Gladys too. Gladys right? and Gladys. Nah, nah, nah. Pat, Patty probably would have got the mic <laughs> and, and get and giving it back either. No, nope. exactly. Mm -mm. Which and was surprising Patty... why yeah. when Aretha, not Aretha, when Whitney and Mariah did when you believe. On the Prince of Egypt soundtrack, I'm like, only mm -hmm. David Foster could have did that. Because I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. nope, nope. It'll be like, <laughs> who's going to see the first verse? Who's going to have the money notes? I can do the whistle, but can you do this? But that's the greatness of a vocalist to where you're so good that when you get another good vocalist on a track with you, you're going to have a hard time trying to figure out who's going to do what and who's going to be in what order, because it was rumored that Bad was originally a collaboration between Michael and Prince. But when oh. uh, Prince had did a special on VH1 with Chris Rock, it was back when he was uh, known as uh, the artist. And he was breaking mm -hmm. it down and was saying, like, who's going to say the your butt is mine line? Because I ain't saying it oh. to you. You ain't saying that to me, <laughs> but looking at it through an adult lens, Michael and Prince yeah. were two totally separate artists, two yeah. totally different lanes, and there was enough room for them to eat, just almost kind of like the same thing how they were trying to pit Cindy Lauper and Madonna against oh, each yeah. other, and how they were two totally separate lanes because Cindy Lauper, if she wanted to, she could go the RB route too. Now, there's a video on YouTube of her and Patty LaBelle doing time after time. And Patty had said that that's one of her favorite records. Now, mm. when you're on stage with Patty, you better come correct. Miss Patty, you better come yeah. correct. Because she'll let you know. And like I said, once she gets that mic, she ain't giving it back. <laughs> I'm laughing because Miss Patty Patty was on the Tyra Bank show. And there was a there was like an interior decorator mm -hmm. um woman on there and mm -hmm. she was doing something and Patty just gave this woman this strange look like like what the fuck is, is she is she doing? So Tyra Tyra saw Patty's body language. So mm -hmm. um is it, it is um is everything all right, Patty? And then Patty was Patty, you know, Patty said what she was saying, and um she was telling the woman like this. Something I forgot what it was, but this was what I was, I was. This is what I was trying to tell you, right. Miss Thing. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Miss Patty was was politely checking her, just like how <laughs> Whitney had to politely check Wendy Williams that one time on the phone, where like oh, Whitney was Whitney was saying, "Don't let this pop stuff get it twisted. I am from Jersey. I can go to the streets if oh, I want yes. to." 
I'm that about that action fun. if I want to. That was funny. And with Wendy Williams, um, I used to always tell people, because people have this thing like, um, if the see, I used to I used to be with a book club. I'm not gonna say the name of the book club, but they always felt that the gay role models had to have been the ones outed by Wendy. So my thing was, why does it have to be these rumored people who y'all want to be gay? There's real, there's actually people who are out there living in their truth. Y'all don't want to recognize them because people's like, oh, if if it ain't from Wendy, I don't really care. But my whole thing about um, the Wendy Allen people, but see, she wasn't doing that to become, to be a, a gay ally. She was just doing that to be dirty. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you you don't out people to be dirty, but some people do. That's what that's how some people make their bread and butter. So I had to tell people just because Wendy is saying someone so's gay doesn't make it a fact. How about the people who are actually out there gay risking their lives? And that was a, that was a recurrent argument I used to have to have. I didn't agree with Wendy doing all that. I mean, I understand Wendy needed the ratings for her mm-hmm. shows because these shows became for the ratings. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, they have to have that their Avatron ratings mm-hmm. rating system going. Mm-hmm. So Wendy did what she did, and but but it's like if people, they, it's like they were waiting for Wendy to out certain people, and it's like she is it, she's not an ally. She's not no gay uh, rights ally. That was just that was just her shtick with her. How are you doing? That's mm-hmm. a shtick, mm-hmm. you know. But when you don't know, you know, when you don't really know. Right. You just you fall for anything, right? You know, I I didn't agree with that, and right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then saying that <laughs> documentary, you know, is sad to see where she is. So you know, prayers for her, and you know what yeah. she's going through. You even though you know what she did, what she did, you hate to see somebody, you know, go through that. What she's gone through, yeah. You know, so prayers up to Wendy Williams and yeah. you know her family, and I hope that she has a full recovery. So before we conclude uh, the interview. My brother, do you have any shout outs you want to give and plug your socials? Okay. Um, I can I can be found on um Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, threads. Um, I just want to give a shout out to my families, my friends. I want to give a shout out to um Rashawn the Professor. I want to thank Rashawn for introducing us together. I just I just I just want to shout out um I just want to shout out my coworkers at Brooklyn Public Library, um, the New York Public Library, and Queen Queen Library. I just want to shout out um, the authors, the writers. Um, I just want to shout out everyone in the world. I just want to shout out um, people who are going through stuff in the world right now. What's going on with Palestine, um, Sudan, the Congo, all these places where people are going through um, human t- humanitarian issues right now. So I just want to. I just want to. I would just want to pray for the entire world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely shout out to everybody that's doing a thing with the librarians, the authors, the illustrators. Be sure to get certain books because you know certain places are trying to ban books that tell the truth because they only want to tell a one sided truth. Take a look; it's in a book, and you don't have to take my word for it. So shout out to Lavar Burton, and uh, you can catch this interview wherever you stream podcasts and also on the official YouTube channel at youtube.com slash beyond the album cover. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big thank you, a round of applause to my bro, Donald Peoples. Mr. Peoples, thank you for coming on to Beyond the Album Cover, and you're welcome to come back anytime. Um, thank, thank you for inviting me to, to your um, show, and um, I would love to come back whenever whenever that will be. Just set the date and the time, and I will be here. And, and I just want to say one last thing before we um, we get off here. Um, please educate yourselves about Project 2025. Please Google it. Find out what Project 2025 is. It's going to change this country. So please be educated about Project 2025. Message.